Um, all right, let's make some recording here. Okay, so five, four, three, two, and one. All right, guys, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. I am very excited to have it back as my guest, Michael Salter. Michael, welcome. Yeah, really good to be here, guy. All right, man. So Associate Professor Michael Salter is a criminologist and Scientia Fellow at the University of New South Wales, where he undertakes research on child sexual exploitation, complex trauma, and gendered violence. He's the author of Organized Sexual Abuse, published by Rutledge, which examines the narratives of adults who are sexually abused by groups of perpetrators as children. Also, Crime, Justice, and Social Media, also published by Rutledge, which details how social media and the internet is impacting sexual offenses and discussions about them. Michael sits on the board of directors of the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, who awarded him in 2018 the Morton Prince Award for Scientific Achievement. He's a national and international consultant to child protection agencies, including the Australian Child Sexual Abuse Prevention Service and the Canadian Center for Child Protection. He's also a practicing Buddhist and has taught a weekly meditation class at his local temple for the last 10 years. And he lives in Sydney with his husband and cat. Awesome. Well, very excited to have you back. Yeah, really good to be here. <laughs> so a lot's been going on um, since we last spoke. You are on episode uh, 362 of this podcast. Mm. Um, and I'll um, direct people to check that out to give kind of context and background. But so well, let's start off here. So, um, you know, before we started, before we were recording here, I asked you how things were going. Share with our listeners how you're doing, given this whole epidemic and, and everything. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's been a really crazy year for us. Um, I mean, here in Australia, we started with the bushfires. So we had, we had massive right. unprecedented fires and a really peculiar situation, um, you know, for, for months and months where the city was actually covered in smoke. Um, and, you know, when you went outside, the sun was red, you know, the sunlight was red and that went on for months and months. So it was actually a really, really draining, strange start to the year. And I think a really a broad sense of a lack of leadership as well. Like the country felt very unsafe. We didn't feel as though the, our political leaders were making the decisions they needed to to keep us safe. And this is also a climate change induced crisis for us here in Australia. The, the bushfires are larger and more frequent because of climate change. Um, and then within a couple of months um, of the bushfires coming under control, um, you know, COVID kicked off. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was overseas at the time. I, I, I was meant to spend most of the first half of this year overseas. And so I had to fly back as soon as possible, wow. you know, it came in just before the borders closed. Um, and we've, we've really been on, on lockdown. Um, a little bit different for us. Um, we, we locked down very early. Um, we're a different country. We're smaller. Our population's quite dispersed. So um, in my state, we haven't had any um, community transmission of COVID now for over two weeks. So all of our restrictions are lifting and people feel quite safe. Mm -hmm. um, so we're transitioning out of that, um, but we've certainly been watching um, events in the United States with a lot of interest. Um, we have significant problems with structural and institutional racism here in Australia, um, particularly relating to our Aboriginal Australians. Um, and so we've we've just had some quite large, unprecedented. You know, I haven't seen protests this big since the Iraq War. Mm. Um, we huge protest in all capital cities around Black Lives Matter this weekend. Wow. So for those uh, listeners who, uh, you know, haven't checked out that first podcast, uh, the interview that we did, give, give those listeners just kind of a basic idea of what it is you do, what's driving you. So I'm, I'm a criminologist. So I study, um, I study criminal offenses. I study um, criminal harm. Um, and what I'm particularly interested in is the sorts of violence and abuse that's committed against people with a dissociative disorder um, and with complex trauma. So um, a lot of my work is looking at organized child sexual abuse um, and premeditated child sex offending. Um, and I do a lot of interview based work, um, particularly with women with dissociative identity disorder, um, because the sorts of childhood experiences they disclose, um, but also the kinds of adult abuse and exploitation they experience is 
um, really poorly understood. And what I find not only in my own country, but you know, when I do work in the UK or the United States, is um, these other countries, just like mine, don't have the service arrangements in place to support um, people with dissociative and complex trauma to not just recover from the abuse, but to prosecute the offenders who harmed them or to keep them safe from ongoing abuse. Um, so that's really what gets me out of bed in the morning. Okay. <laughs> so what you said, uh, certain peoples or communities or uh, countries even don't have the resources uh, to, to under, or don't understand what fully what's going on here. What are they not understanding? Generally, complex trauma, I think, is a paradigm shift. It's, you know, it's a paradigm in the sense that it challenges the pre-existing, in mental health, it challenges the pre-existing psychiatric set of assumptions about what is mental illness and where does mental illness come from. And so, you know, we, we're all, all of our mental health systems are grounded in psychiatric and psychological expertise but unfortunately as far as complex trauma is concerned um, you know those foundational assumptions um, just are not a good fit with the reality of trauma and the reality of the, the lives of traumatized people um, and that's also true of the criminal justice system and of um, law enforcement um, they are not trained in a trauma-informed mm. model they don't think in the way that those of us who work in the trauma field think and as a result, we consistently find that people with complex trauma are just a bad fit for so many of the services and the systems that have been set up supposedly to support them and protect them. But they're like a square peg in a round hole. Um, we've just finished quite a large study here in Australia um, and it's, it's, um, it's publicly available. It's about 170 um, pages. It's a massive, um, massive bit of work uh, for us. Um, we interviewed 40 women with complex trauma and we interviewed over 60 professionals who work in a range of different sectors. So we interviewed um, not just mental health, but people working in child protection, alcohol and drug, homelessness, um, legal services, about their experience with clients with complex trauma. And it was an interview-based study because we were really trying to get a sense of, you know, what's, what's the inside experience for women with complex trauma as they're not just approaching mental health, but they're approaching police. They're intersecting with the child protection system. They need treatment for alcohol and drug issues and so on. What's their experience of those systems? Um, and this idea of just not fitting just came up time and time again. Um, they're just not getting what they need. And ultimately that's not a clinical issue, that's a public policy issue. Um, and we walked away from the study with really this sense of complex trauma being a different paradigm than the assumptions that most systems are set up on. So, for example, looking through the eyes of um, one of the workers you interviewed, what might they have said in this, in this study? What was a common yeah. re response in a sense? Yeah, so we had, um, I mean, one of the um, interviews that really sticks out for me was um, it was a nurse um, who'd started working in an emergency department um, and he now worked in a community-based um, health system, which he really liked and he felt was doing really good work with complex trauma. But he was talking about how, you know, when people presented to the emergency department when he was a nurse, you, you'd never ask them about their history. You don't want to know their history because all that you care about mm. in an emergency department is their presenting issue. You know, you want to know how injured they are um, and what's the, um, you know, what are their care needs right now. And he, he said, you know, in an emergency department, trauma means injury. Trauma means what's, what's happened to you right now. And he said, you know, now in my new job in this community-based mental health system, trauma means history. You know, mm. trauma doesn't mean right now. Trauma means what happened to you. And I think it was a really good illustration where we have a lot of systems that are set up, firstly, for people in crisis, because we do a bad job of intervening early before people have escalated to crisis. But then when they present in crisis, we just look at their presenting issue. We look at their symptoms. We look at um, what they need right now. And that really does harm to people with complex trauma because you know, we need to see them um, as a whole person, um, particularly when they present in crisis, because often they present in crisis quite
quite messy. They can be really difficult. They can be really challenging. And that's not the whole person. If that's all that we see them as, which many systems do, um, then we do an injury to them in addition to the injury that they're presenting with because we invalidate them, we dismiss them, we trivialise them, and we don't understand the complexity of their presenting issue, and then we don't treat them correctly. That's right. You know, as you're talking, I'm thinking to myself of just this whole topic every time... <laughs> You know, I, I remember when when you and I first talked, I was just struck by, and I remember using this word, the intensity of what you do. I mean, complex, ritualized trauma. There's there's no getting around it. I mean, it's 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 ugly. It's it, it hits you on a gut level. Mm -hmm. To what degree did uh, this topic come up in the, in the, in these interviews, if at all? Just the sheer. Uh, kind of existential difficulty of talking about this and, and, and confronting this topic? You know, just because of the work that I do, and we also had um, other, um, one of the other investigators in this study um, was Warwick Middleton, who's also a very well-known specialist in dissociative identity disorder. So of the 40 women that we interviewed, I think it was at least six had a, a diagnosis of dissociative identity disorder. And we spoke to other women uh, who would probably have met the, the criteria as well. And, you know, it, of those 40 women, what was really interesting and really important was just how diverse their experiences were. You know, mm. we talk about domestic violence, we talk about sexual assault, but that didn't really capture the things that were happening to them. Um, one of the women that we interviewed, um, she'd been quite severely um, sexually abused by her parents when she was a kid, and she was now in her mid-30s, and at the time of interview was still living at home with her parents who were still abusing her because she was too unwell to leave. Um, she would tried to leave before, but she couldn't um, maintain her independence because she was just psychologically, she was too unwell to live um, without support. Um, and it was a really kind of striking moment in the interview. Um, she approached a public housing service looking for social housing. Um, and she explained her situation to them and she was quite vocal about what was happening to her. She didn't really keep it, keep it quiet. So people knew about it. And the public housing um, bureaucrat said to her, well, look, your parents aren't threat. They might be abusing you, but they're not threatening to kill you. So you're not really a priority for us. And he gave her a pamphlet on how to prepare for homelessness. Um, so that if she left home and she became homeless, she had a resource to help her be homeless. Mm. Um, so we, we, you know, certainly in this study, we, we came across a lot of organized abuse for, for women, both um, women who'd survived organized abuse in childhood and some women where that was continuing into adulthood. And just the, just the absolute cliff of, there was just nothing available for them. Um, and professionals talk to us a lot about this as well. So professional, I mean, one professional said to me, I don't have the words for some of the things that are happening to my clients. Mm -hmm. um, and the vulnerability of some adult clients. Um, you know, when if, if a child is being abused, then we have statutory obligations to report those to services. And those services are obliged by legislation to protect that child. Mm -hmm. We can talk about whether they do a good job or not, which is probably another podcast. But um, that was, she was talking about the fact that wasn't the case for her adult clients, some of whom, again, still being abused, unable to keep themselves safe. And whose job was it to, to support them and protect them? Um, so this was a, really an issue in this study that we wanted to situate within the broader spectrum of violence against women, including more commonly recognized um, forms such as domestic and intimate partner violence. Mm. So what do you think needs, uh, uh, what needs to happen? I mean, obviously on a, on a macro level, on a, on a micro level, but what are, what are some of the beginning steps? We need a significant shift in psychological and psychiatric education. Um, most mental health professionals leave um, higher, so they leave university with little to no literacy in trauma, which is absolutely just, really hard to understand when you look at the burden of trauma related mental illness in the community there's clearly a disjunction between 
tertiary cur curricula, so university curricula and mental health, um, and the actual demand in the community. So we really do need accrediting bodies like the American Psychological Association to require universities and um, uh, to, pr to ensure that everyone who's graduating to practice clinically is actually competent, at least competent in trauma. So I think that would be a huge change and I suspect it's coming, but we are going to need to push for it because these um, organisations are not moving quickly enough. Um, and then, you know, we need an honest conversation about our mental health system. And I know that the United States has been really talking about um, some of the, the issues and challenges in your health system, which is quite different to, to ours. Um, but, you know, we have a, you know, when we look at complex trauma, this is a group of people with multiple presenting issues who are then going into a health system where each agency is funded often to address one thing. Um, and so if you're a person with five things, you can't find one agency that can provide you with all the things you need. Um, and for some of the women that we interviewed, you know, they were bouncing between six or seven appointments every week. And those appointments were really geographically dispersed. So they're trying to raise their kids because they're a mum. They're trying to cope with complex trauma and they're bouncing between seven appointments that might be an hour's drive each way. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to do here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to, I do want to get to uh, the topic of the internet when I, mean, I think it's, it's very topical right now, but before we go there, do you, do you talk to, uh, clinicians or therapists? Is it, what do you hear from them? What are, what are they needing to, to know? What are they yearning for? Yeah, I mean, I, I, do, a lot of, um, I do a lot of work with therapists and, and mental health workers. I provide a lot of training. Um, you know, I, I think the, the, particularly in the complex trauma work, um, you know, the, like um, uh, an aspect, a really key aspect of complex trauma is hopelessness. You know, that's part of the experience of complex trauma is hopelessness. And it's infectious as well. You know, if you're not prepared for it, if you come in to do work with clients with complex trauma, it's really easy to take on their hopelessness. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the most important messages always to clinicians is, is hope, actually. Um, and is, you know, just to let people know that they have what their clients need. It doesn't mean that they can't skill up, they can't learn new techniques. Um, but I will say, you know, often when I'm doing training and I'm there to, to talk about the content and I'm there to, you know, um, provide information, but also that kind of spirit of hope to say to people, you know, you can, it's not going to be easy, but you can do this mm -hmm. is important. At the same time, recognizing the limitations of the systems that we're in. Um, and, and, and I think we do, you know, those of us at the front line who are practitioners, we do need to speak with a voice. We do need to be political um, and we do need to, to advocate for our clients because um, at the moment, the systems are not supporting them to live safe, happy lives. Um, and we shouldn't be quiet about that. And we, we need to come up with our own solutions as well. It's, it's not enough just to complain. We need to have a blueprint for change. Do you think that... The, you know, you talked about a paradigm shift. Do you think that th this topic is becoming more uh, exposed, more commonplace? Are the discussions happening more and more? I, I think that it, that it absolutely is because um, we are, I think, pushing up against the limits of the previous psychological and psychiatric paradigm. I think it's taken us as far as it can, but it's just it's just not delivering gains for enough people. Um, and we can't ignore trauma anymore. It's, it, it's, it's just breaking the system apart, basically. And so the system is going to have to adjust. Um, you know, and it, it has been because of trauma. Therapists and experts and researchers who have just documented and documented and, and frankly, survivors. You know, we, we always need to give um, credit to... Um, survivors who have been um, agitating and advocating for decades as well. Um, so I, th I think this conversation is much more public and visible. Um, this, this study that we've just finished, we've actually got funding as part of the study to do a series of policy roundtables where we're going to 
um, three capital cities, including Canberra, which is our national capital. And we're not talking to therapists, we're talking to policymakers. We're getting people into the room once COVID, <laughs> once we're allowed to with COVID, getting people into the room and saying to them, well, what are the implications for you as someone who makes these decisions and controls the funding levers? Um, because really the conclusion that we came away with from the complex trauma study is this isn't working. We need to do things mm -hmm. differently. Wow. All right. So shifting gears here a little, your uh, book, um, Crime Justice and Social Media, which was published in 2017. I mean, just the, the topic of social media and crime and justice, but, but trauma also. Um, I mean, to me, it just feels like it's exponentially negatively impacting and, and exacerbating this whole issue in a sense. Um, what was your impetus for, for writing the book in the first place? I was, um, I was invited um, probably about eight years ago now, and it was because of my work in organized abuse and particularly the manufacture of child sexual abuse material. So um, I was invited to um, come in on a study um, looking at young people's use of technology because for the first time, um, what we were starting to see in 2012, or what we're starting to realize, is that if you give teenagers phones, internet connected phones that have cameras in them, one of the things that some teenagers do is start taking nude photos of themselves. And, um, you know, child pornography legislation was not written with the defense in it for self manufactured by minors because nobody imagined in 1978 that young people, children, would ever be in a position to manufacture <laughs> images of themselves. Um, and so I came in on a study looking at sort of young people and sex and technology. Um, and it's really just sort of expanded from there. Um, I've, I now work quite a lot um, internationally and, and here in Australia um, around um, online pedophile rings um, and online harms. And that's a really important part of my, my work. Um, and one of the things that it has made visible is just the extent of demand in the community for child sexual abuse material. Um, this, is not, this is not a small black market. This is not niche. Um, we, we're looking at somewhere between two to four percent of men in the community have regularly accessed child sexual abuse material. Mm. Um, we also face, frankly, a technology industry um, that has not taken this issue seriously um, for 20 years because uh, it just financially wasn't in their interest to admit how much online child abuse was happening. Um, and we're now in a position where, um, you know, the United States authorities last year received 70 million, and I'll repeat that, 70 million reports of online child sexual abuse images and videos in 2019. Oh my God. Mm. I mean, this is, it's, it's astounding and it's depressing. <laughs> I mean, and I'm thinking to myself how, uh, you know, as someone who was a therapist, and obviously a lot of therapists are listening to this, uh, what what do they need to know about this topic? In the sense of, you know, you talked about hope, but mm. more than that, what do you say to them? I think you know when you work in the trauma field and you hear it's like working in a parallel universe. You know, you hear clients disclosing things, talking about things. It's like a substratum of, of the human condition that's invisible um, to kind of mainstream society. Um, and it's one of the things that can be quite um, alienating and isolating about working in complex trauma. Look, one of the things I'll say about the internet is that it makes all of this very, very visible um, and it makes it undeniable. Um, now, yes, the, the internet is also um, you know, it's a, a medium for a lot of harm. It's, 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 um, it's causing a lot of harm, um, but also it's, it's bringing to light a lot of issues that have been buried for a long time. Um, and I'd also say, look, you know, the internet's the reason why you and I are connecting right now. It's the reason why, you know, your audience is connecting with you. It's the reason why, you know, many survivors are much more empowered than they were in the past. Um, because of because of the internet. So I think um, 
you know, I, I have to remind myself <laughs> working in the, uh, the online space, you know, the, the internet's done, done a lot and it's done a lot for the trauma field. Um, it's not all bad, although sometimes, frankly, it, it feels that way. Mm. One of the things that, you know, I, I wanted to bring up, and since we talked, however many months ago that was, um, you know, I, I follow you on Twitter and you're pretty active there. And I, I noticed that, I mean, there's a contingency of, you know, people who are flat out disbelieve what we're talking mm. about. Yes. Talk about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and where do you start with that? Yeah, look, um, particularly in the online space, um, you know, just the, the internet the tech companies have to pay the piper at some point. Um, look, they've, they've ignored this for a long time. But I think also that, you know, I, I grew up with, you know, I was a teenager in the 90s. I grew up with the myth of the internet. I grew up with this myth that, you know, the internet was going to free us and it was going to save us. And, um, you know, it was this incredible, exciting, democratic, anarchist space um, that was going to liberate us. And, you know, the internet's done none of those things, frankly. You know, the internet's been captured by a, a number of, you know, enormous corporate companies who have happily circulated um, you know, propaganda about how magic the internet is. And we need to kind of wake up from the dream. Um, and we need to admit how bad things have gotten when it comes to online child abuse. Um, and I think that's hard, not just for tech companies who don't want to have that conversation, but it's hard for, you know, for people like me who want to believe in the promise of the internet. And it, it just hasn't, it just hasn't delivered. So you think the the kind of disbelief is coming more from a, a kind of a, from grander, if you will, or, or corporate structure? Look, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, those of us that work in this space, I, there are things that I can't, I, I am shocked. My, my jaw is frequently on the floor about the inaction of tech companies um, and frankly, their disinterest in child protection. And I think this is the other piece that's hard for tech companies and hard for the community which is that, you know, we have not just legal obligations to children, we have moral obligations to keep children safe. If you are an adult, you have a moral obligation to keep children safe. And children are on the internet, therefore, the internet needs to be child safe. Yeah, we need to build in safety measures to protect children. Um, you know, we, we need to build those measures into the infrastructure of the internet or else we are just going to keep seeing, you know, this cycle of abuse continue online. And that's difficult for people to wrap their heads around. They don't want to think about kids. They just want to think about their own needs, frankly. I want to remind everyone that I'm speaking with Dr. Michael Salter. Michael, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? I look, always Twitter, now that we've okay. been slagging off the internet. Um, Twitter, um, Mike <laughs> underscore Salter at Twitter. Okay. Um, or or via, um, via, uh, via email is, is, is great. I love to hear from people. Okay, and I'll have that linked up at the show notes page at the traumatherapistpodcast.com. Now, you mentioned this uh, study. Can you send me a link to that? Yes. And can 100%. people access that? Okay. So yeah. as we get ready to close out here, you know, Again, people are listening to this. I mentioned you know, a lot of therapists and so forth, survivors, coaches, therapists of all kinds. Who's doing a good job in terms of recognizing this? You know, I mentioned in your bio, the International Study, mm -hmm. International Society for the Study of Trauma Association. But I mean, in addition to them, but who, who's doing a good good job in terms of blowing this open, of recognizing this, of providing education? Look, we, we can't underestimate the power of the grassroots. And um, the last couple of months, I've been partnering with a local uh, women's health service here in my state. Um, they came up separately from me, but I think it's brilliant. They came up with this idea of a one-stop shop for complex trauma. Um, so it's the Illawarra Women's Health Service, and they've come up with this model, and it's called the Women's Trauma Recovery Center. And the idea is that this is one, one place for their community where women with complex trauma can come um, and, and get their needs met. 
So what Illawarra has done is they've gotten a little bit of funding from our state government to develop the model. And so they're currently um, co-designing the Women's Recovery Centre with women. Um, and there's a really strong Aboriginal voice in this project. So the, um, the, stu the, the study is actually Aboriginal led um, and significant Aboriginal leadership is part of it. Um, and so our aim is that in a year's time, we'll actually have a model that's partly costed that we can then go to the government and say, this is what we need. You know, this is what this, is what this region needs. Um, but for me, it's really exciting. I've never heard of anything like this um, before. And I think it's a really amazing model um, for us to think about in terms of trauma care where therap there, there would be therapists but there'd also be physiotherapists and there would be case managers and there would be good, warm relationships with local law enforcement and there'd be housing and so on. So I think that's amazing. And it also just tells us something about the grassroots. So, so yes, there's my organisation, so the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation. We're seeing more and more momentum in the American Psychological Association and other psychology and psychiatry um, associations around the world, so that's really important. But yeah, the one thing that I would say to, to people that are listening is don't devalue your voice and the change that you can make at a local level, because um, that's real change. Awesome. Man, Michael, I love talking to you. You are one inspired dude um, and uh, always welcome back here. Um, so again, uh, Dr. Michael Salter will have uh, everything linked up here at the show notes page. And um, again, be well, my friend. You too, mate. Thank you. All right, take care.